Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Very warm welcome yet to another episode of Coffee Table. The climate change has, you know, has become a big phenomenon. It is changing world, and uh, that is especially bad for arid zone and the countries that come in the area have to grapple with so many problems: disaster on one hand, instant flooding, lack of water, which was available then. and that bring bring problems for livelihoods that spurs a migration and many value chains are broken so these are few issues that cannot be handled single handedly by countries and the communities and they need a global program some sort of consultation and implementation on the uh, ground obviously it is global prospect with local implementation strategy and all that for which IDRC is running a program uh, called Karya, and the price is a component of that which is being implemented in Pakistan because Pakistan most of land people don't know fall in the arid zone. The water that runs in Pakistan is in agriculture in the command centers, sort of an artificial from dams and everything. We have today a very important guest. Whose, whose scholarship is uh, very much matured in the area, Dr. Evan Kutui. It's right pronunciation. Kutui. Kutui. Dr. Evan Kutui, a senior program specialist, agriculture and environment, for Price and IDRC. Doctor, very warm welcome. Thank you. Um, how about Pakistan? Pakistan is a good country. It looks yeah. beautiful. Very uh, friendly people. Yeah. I've had a chance to at least uh, travel to uh, one or two cities, um, and I think I enjoyed it. It was it. it's good so far. Well, how do you think Pakistan is facing these problems that you just mentioned about climate change? <coughs> um, I think it's not just Pakistan. This is a global problem, yeah. like you've uh, rightly said in your introduction. Uh, <coughs> We know that the phenomenon of climate change, global warming, is happening um, all over. It's uh, something that uh, Pakistan is not to blame for. Uh, we know from the science that uh, greenhouse gas emissions that have been emitted over the many years since the industrialization uh, of the globe started, particularly in the West, um, has led to the accumulation of uh, these gases in the atmosphere, which are responsible for. the warming that we are experiencing and uh, the trends are that is going to continue and uh, unfortunately uh, the uh, globe will be affected differently uh, different countries different regions will experience this in different forms and uh, we have evidence also that the, uh, the semi arid zones will particularly uh, suffer a lot of the consequences Uh, the reason being that um, uh, the, 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 you know the, the location of these uh, zones hasn't really favored the communities that live in there. We have the first challenge being that there is a very strong climate signal over the semi-arid zones, and the predictions are that as temperature increases. the semi arid zones are going to suffer more um these zones most of them are characterized by being um you know dry they don't get a lot of rainfall they don't have a lot of um you know vegetation and stuff like that they are not endowed by a lot of resources uh, for which the people can you know benefit from to recover and secondly these are also regions of high populations right of very poor people Okay. Poverty uh, concentration. Yes, poverty is a key thing. So if you take the map showing strong climate signal in the globe and overlay it over another map showing the high concentrations of people who are poor, people whose earnings are below a certain amount per year or per day, uh, whichever way you want to look at it, okay. you find that it's very strong in the uh, semi-arid areas. Is some sort of an overlap. Exactly. and uh, Pakistan happens to be one of those countries and that is why we have the interest to be involved <coughs> what are the principal areas you are uh, tackling in pakistan um 
First, we are looking at um, the, the, and of course these were identified by SDPI and its partners um, in the consortium in which they are working, uh, which uh, is led by ODI in, in the UK. We have London School of Economics. We also have uh, IED Afrique in uh, Dakar in Senegal, in Africa. So together, jointly, having looked at this uh, map that overlays these two conditions, came up with uh, case study areas through stakeholder engagement meetings here in Pakistan. So these are not areas that SDPI just picked randomly. Get it, so. They met with stakeholders here in Pakistan and that was one source of identifying where to focus. The second thing they did was they commissioned uh, a, a detailed study to do uh, uh, what we call um, country situation assessment. Looking at all the literature that's available, talking to the government people, all the institutions that are involved in Pakistan, in natural resource management, <coughs> in population, health, all this. And they all pointed to where the biggest challenge would be. Right. And then finally, they went around with, uh, you know, these documents and reports to different people around Pakistan <coughs> to share the findings that are coming out and to receive additional comment from them. And that led to the strengthening of those particular reports. And so the, when they listed the areas which needed intervention, they identified one being the migration area, the issue of migration. Due to climate change. Uh, well, we are not very sure, but now they are doing the research to see the extent to which climate change could be responsible, responsible for the migration that is being observed in the DJ Khan uh, region in particular. The second area is on flooding, and uh, <coughs> this is in the Jiang area in particular, we, 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 we were able to visit this uh, in the last three days and uh, you know just to see the magnitude of the problem and also the kind of interventions that the government of uh, Pakistan has put in place and uh, ideally to see what kind of additional gaps exist that need to be filled. So this is where the research is focusing and uh, thirdly we have the cotton sector right. in Pakistan. The, the sector is very uh, fundamental to uh, people's livelihoods. Um, it provides jobs, it provides uh, you know, uh, the income to the industry, the private sector development and so on. General growth of the country, exactly. exports. Yes, yeah. you export a lot yeah. and also just to provide jobs for people. Uh, I'm told it's quite a vast industry. But now, because of climate change, uh, and this again we had discussions with uh, the University of Faisalabad, which is contributing to the studies on uh, the agronomy of uh, cotton and so on. They show that uh, the, gr the, the, the production from the cotton sector is dwindling. Dwindling. Yes. And uh, instead, people are shifting towards uh, sugar, sugar cane, and uh, something else they, which they mentioned. Wheat. Uh, rice. I think rice and sugar. Rice and sugar. That's yeah. bad because they're both water intensive. Exactly. But again, it's because the bad private choice. sector, the private sector that is managing the rice sector and the sugar At sector the time being they make are are pumping in a lot of uh, incentives to encourage the farmers to grow those and the, probably the coffee sector, private sector drivers probably need to do the same to be able to retain the, <laughs> the interest of the farmers. Yeah. yeah. So uh, because of these and many other factors, climatic factors and so on, uh, the cotton sector is bound to suffer. And so there is Production. need, exactly. So there is need to strengthen the entire value chain from production, processing, to transport, to marketing, and finally 
to export and so on. The, yes, there is a big export market out there that needs cotton. But this cotton is not, the sector is not exploiting those channels. Probably they are selling to just one or two international outlets. Yeah. But what the preliminary studies are showing is that the market out there is vast and there is more potential for the right. Pakistan sector to be able to tap into right. that. Yeah. So these are the three sectors. And here we take a break, as Dr. Evan has rightly pointed out, the three principal sectors they are initially selected, try, uh, being hit by climate change, and the research is going on what could be done and how to save them or to, I mean, to reprofile the sectors or whatever the need is, research is going to show. And we'll do more analysis on that after the break. Please stay with us. Diverse. It's original. It's Welcome back. So, uh, uh, what your research is showing at this moment? Um, the team actually, you have the team in house. Yeah. I think they will be the best people to speak on oh. this. Uh, but I just have a general uh, understanding of what is coming out preliminarily and um, they are also still collecting and analyzing some data verifying validating so we cannot conclusively say yeah. that these are the final findings but pr maybe within the next two three months we should be able to have those finalized but uh, more generally uh, one of the things we are learning from the migration uh, studies is that um, you know people are moving driven not necessarily it's still not clear again from the analysis whether it is purely climatic factors but the kind of things that um, you know are making them to move are in many ways related to climatic factors for example when people say uh, they are moving because they are no longer um, able to produce uh, their crop in yields that can be able to sustain them. That is directly, it could be directly linked to that. But uh, there are some of the challenges we are getting also. Um, uh, you know, there is knowledge that people will be more resilient. It is more resilient for people who migrate than to the families that are left behind that don't have anybody who has migrated. So this is something that is uh, quite interesting. But when you compare with what is coming out in a country like Burkina Faso, the, 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 because this project compares with the, the component in Africa where uh, they are also sharing the same studies, you find that people uh, would have moved, or even the one in Kenya, in particularly Kenya also, where they are saying that if only they had information about where they are going, and if the opportunities are there for uh, small business, or if opportunities are there for farming and so on, then they would have made a decision to move. So most people tend to stay back because they don't have that information. But those who dare go, I mean, they just go and say, whatever we find, we will try and settle in and see what happens. And for some reason, those who move out end up getting some form of work where they're able to save and, uh, you know, send money uh, back home. And they're more resilient that way. But the other question that people are asking from the studies is whether the remittances that they get back are being used for okay. activities that will lead towards their resilience, yes. So that's w one question that is uh, still, um, we, we're still awaiting a proper uh, finalization of those results. Uh, when you go to the cotton mm -hmm. sector, again, like I mentioned, um, the seeds are a problem 
when it comes to the very first stage of the, uh, the value chain, um, and this was confirmed by the professors at Faisalabad who are supporting the team, the seed quality, seed varieties are still a challenge. So there is need for research to develop better seeds. Develop better or just adopt the BT one? Uh, well, BT is one option. They gave that as an option. Is it a good option or bad option? I don't know. Uh, don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know. But uh, this is what the experts were saying. There is the BT option, but you know it's limited by policy. The Pakistani policy needs to be clear on biotechnology and the role of biotechnology, particularly for the cotton sector. But uh, on the other hand, there's more research needed on the seeds that the farmers are using now so that they can produce more heat resistant uh, right. uh, seeds and so that on. That is valid. Yeah. And also, there is need for uh, the uh, sector to open up. There are many opportunities for vertical uh, transformation of the sector, meaning that the, the opportunities for making uh, some of the stages better, more efficient, and so on, so that they can be able to produce, um, you know, uh, sufficient volumes of cotton and harness appropriate markets out there and also be able to earn better monies uh, for the sector. Um, I think for the flooding, for the flooding is where we still do not have sufficient data yet. They are still trying to analyze a lot of it. But again, you find that um, particularly looking at the, the political economy angle that uh, the research is looking at the study, it's a very interesting one. And um, we still are awaiting to see what kind of results are going to come out exactly but otherwise going on the ground you can you can see the reality on the but ground. flooding has been unprecedented and I mean during the last 2010 then a, an episode was in some form repeated mm -hmm. then the floods up in the northern areas up there the close to the glaciers the glaciers yes. are busting out mm -hmm. and form the glacial lakes mm -hmm. and then those lakes uh, overflowing here overflowing. in Pakistan Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, 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 the challenge here now is how are communities that live uh, downstream going to be affected by this? And for the young case, for example, we are looking at sh in cases when the river overflows and it covers all these crop fields and so on, and people move to the uh, safety uh, banks that were built. Okay. Uh, the dikes. Issue, yes, the dikes, uh, thanks for the correction. The question then becomes, uh, for how long are these people going to be here uh, since this thing happens year in, year out, like you're saying? Um, They're doing it for the last yeah. 50 years. And when it happens, uh, you don't know how to respond to people who uh, like the professor in uh, Faisalabad was saying, that these are illegal uh, occupants of the land and that a legal solution is required. And if, if you say a legal solution, it means removing those families yeah, it's very to wherever. And that... Throughout the, you know, throughout the length yes. of the river, which is in thousand kilometers. Yes. They cultivate inside the river. You see? Inside the, inside the river bed. Yes. So it's very difficult. Yeah. yeah. And so politically, that is not... Even socially. Yeah. And socially. It's very difficult. Yeah. But legally, that is the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. would have been the right thing to do. Exactly. So that is what... Um, and they're the, big the, communities. The, yeah. And so <coughs> so the, this is what these people are, b are trying to battle with. And then there are the interests of the big magnets, you know, the... the, the the, the, the big businessmen and, or you know people who own big chunks of land some big of them, and some of them could be in government some of them could be so how do you balance those interests so this is what the research uh, that uh, is being led by uh, in the house solution. exactly so that's why they are considering the political economy of uh, decision making process in the case of floods um, in pakistan Right. Yeah.
So right, okay. Where we here we take another break, and after the break, we'll try to synthesize this knowledge that Dr. Evans has just shared with you, and try to come up with a few suggestions. Please stay with us. Welcome back. So, quickly for our viewers, what are the solutions? Just give one liner on on each of them. Okay. I cannot give solutions uh, because these are. Some of these are politically sensitive, some of these are, uh, you know, practical maybe in, 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 in some countries and not other countries. Uh, we are fully going to rely on how the researchers in SDPI engage with the key stakeholders in uh, Pakistan, both in government and in practice, to come up with balanced solutions that they think they can propose to um, the, the, the government for adoption. And for me, I think um, one of the things that we need to be guided by is we are now in an era where we are trying to achieve what you call the Sustainable Development Goals. And key um, theme underpinning these goals it's is poverty. poverty and that nobody should be left behind yeah. as we develop. That is the only goal. Okay. <laughs> yes, so, if, but at the end of the day, we have these 17 key goals under this framework, yeah. okay, that uh, we need to be guided by in all the solutions or decisions that we come up with. And we as IDRC, uh, what motivated us to fund these studies, uh, together with DFID, uh, who is a key donor that we are partnering with to support the career initiative and that's why we put in about 13.5 million dollars to these four organizations to work together to develop these solutions is to be able to generate solutions or to generate research options uh, that can influence development positively in these countries and particularly we are interested in them developing solutions that are both inclusive and climate resilient. Right. Okay? These are the two underpinning things, inclusive. And that preaches so much for the SDGs where they say nobody should be left behind. So we want to make sure that uh, women, children, the aged, and so on, all of them are taken well, care of by inclusive. exactly yeah yeah and they have those solutions other, other than that thing that they have to be climate resilient um, and there is the third emphasis that uh, your team uh, put in that they have to contribute to economic growth yeah. uh, that is fast also not just uh, growing at some rate but it must be fast growth um, to the economy. So these are the catchwords that we thought, okay, let us invest in these in this, in this, uh, studies. Right. And uh, we believe that um, if this research is implemented well and mechanisms put in place for scaling up of the solutions that are going to come out of this research, then we believe that uh, uh, sustainable development is going to be achieved. Right. Yes. So with this, we end program here. Do not want to end, analyze it further. Add anything from my side. Dr. Evan was very clear in coming up with the buzzwords which has been given, and obviously they gel in well to the global uh, goal of uh, eliminating poverty, which is translated through 17 other targets and goals of the sustainable development goals as we know them. So here we say goodbye. Next time, next guest, next topic. 
please keep watching our programs.